there. My name is Dixon Musake. I'm a servant of Christ. And today, I would like to talk about the difficult topic of suffering. No one can, no one will. Who will stand against the King? No one can. No one will oh, 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 oh. Victory belongs to Jesus No one likes to, to suffer So there are typically three types of suffering Or three categories The first one is as a result of us breaking natural laws Or cause and effect the second one is as a result of being a Christian, that is persecution. And the third one is what most people struggle with, especially non-Christians, one where there is no explainable cause, and especially where you have vulnerable people um, involved, and this is where people often accuse God of being cruel. So, in my own experience, Probably this is the first time I'm narrating it. Um, for a period of about 15 years growing up in Africa, we went through a period of abject poverty. Now, if you're from another part of the world, you probably think that, well, everyone in Africa suffers, but there's a category of people who would be considered middle class. And on script or on paper, we should have been middle class, Mm, my my father had been quite smart in class and he had been successful in his career. And then unfortunately, due to alcoholism, um, we fell off the path and then we went through a period of, of a lot of poverty. And uh, at one point when I, for example, went into boarding school in secondary, this is a, a, it was a middle class boarding school. If you're from the UK, it is the equivalent of, for example, going to, to Eton. Unfortunately, I was one of those who, for example, when it came to paying school fees, my parents couldn't afford school fees, so I was sent out of school to go home. Or when the school term began, um, I would be one of those who comes late, maybe one week late, and even then with not all the school fees. But I think the, the, the most humiliating was during school visitation day when uh, many of my schoolmates, their parents were usually the wealthy ones, maybe the prime minister's children or government ministers. And so their parents came to visit them in the, in the best cars and the newest car models. Their parents are successful business people. If I was lucky for my mom to come to visit, she would often come with public transport and it is quite humiliating where everyone's parents are coming with fancy cars and they're sitting with their parents. My mom has come with public transport. And uh, it was quite a, it was quite tough and I, and I thank God that uh, he gave me the grace not to get angry uh, at him because this is where a lot of people reject God because they think, where are you during uh, the period of suffering? So if I was to categorize the suffering that that I went through, it would really be, if you want to think about it, category one, as a result of breaking natural laws. And the principle being, my dad abused alcohol. And so we, we suffered the consequence. And uh, the way the, the Bible looks at it, and the, way, the principle is that God has put in place a number of laws, almost like cause and effect, being that um, if a Christian, for example, breaks those laws, unfortunately, because of those laws, uh, God has appointed authorities to enforce the laws. And uh, the example is, uh, the Bible addresses it as this, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, which, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it's God's will that by doing good, he should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Now, the principle of this is that if you must suffer, let it be for doing good and not doing wrong. And the principle of this is that Christians are called to live lives of integrity 
okay? And if they're living lives of integrity, it means, for example, you are not breaking tax laws, you are not caught doing uh, wrong things, and as a result of that, unfortunately, you end up suffering. And uh, a friend of mine called Charles, uh, who's quite modest and he doesn't like his name published, but I've not given his second name, when he read the initial manuscript that that I shared with him for this, he actually gave me good insight. And he, in this part, he said, for example, this kind of suffering could be like a megaphone that God is giving you where he is saying that almost like, be careful and repent of your sins, lest something worse happens. Nevertheless, um, the important principle of this is if another person is suffering as a result of even their own um, sins or mistakes, we should be compassionate. And Jesus told an interesting uh, story or parable of what would happen on the day of, of judgment. And he explained it thus. He said, this is to the people who, who were on his right hand, the sheep. He said, I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. So think about it. You have people in prison. There are many people in prison, I guess the majority, as a result of their own mistakes. But Jesus is saying, be compassionate to people who are suffering, even for their own mistakes. So category two then, um, how about people who are suffering directly as a result of being Christians? And in this day and age, we have a lot of our brothers and sisters who are in countries where to be a Christian seems to be a crime. And how does the Bible deal with those who are suffering? Um, the Bible takes the view that you are suffering for God's sake and you should rejoice. And, and let me just read it for you. Um, it says, Happy are you if you are insulted because you're Christ's followers. So it's almost like God is saying, if you're suffering for my sake, rejoice because my Holy Spirit is resting on you and your salvation is near. And in fact, the Apostle Paul, um, he seemed to post in his sufferings and in a very interesting length, lengthy passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 from verse 23 to 30, Paul describes his numerous sufferings. He's talking about enduring sleepless nights and so on and so forth. And he concludes by saying, if I must boast, I would rather boast about the things that show how weak I am. Because God shows that his strength comes through, especially when we are weak and when we are suffering. Now, how about category three, if you are suffering and there is no discernible reason that people who are going through immense suffering right now, probably that is why you Googled or you found this video because you're going through suffering and you'd like to, to understand um, why you are suffering. Now, unfortunately, we live in a world where it's a fallen world and because of sin, there is God's judgment. But even then, I do not know fully why we suffer. But Jesus explained it um, this way. And uh, this is from the book of Luke. Now, there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sufferings. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. All those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will perish. So if you think about it, Jesus is making it clear that it is not a one for one. Those ones who are suffering and facing, if you want to say, punishment, they're more evil than the ones who survive. Jesus is saying, no, it is not like that. He is focusing on your personal response. How about you? How about you? Have you repented? And that is Jesus' focus. But this is now where people say, but where is God when I'm suffering? 
And I think the best illustration is there's a story in the Bible where a man called Lazarus was sick and then he died. And then his sisters called Mary and Martha came out and, and told Jesus about it. And, and this is what, how, what, how the Bible describes it. When Jesus saw her weeping, this is our Mary, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. So you can see that despite suffering being in the world, despite the pain of suffering, God is with us going through the suffering. And it's almost like um, the overall message of suffering, as one good uh, Christian resource put it, that for all Christians who are going through suffering, you should know that suffering comes and during suffering, God is with you. But in the end, God wins. So persevere, so endure, just like your brethren all around the world. In fact, as a message of hope, this is what the Bible describes what will happen at the end. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. So that's how we know that the end will come. And so now, let's think about it. How did God himself deal with suffering? When Jesus himself was on this earth, he went through a period of immense pain and suffering. And this is described when he was in, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, this is in, Matthew, in Mark chapter 14 from verse 32 to 34. There were three things that give us a model or a pattern of what happened when Jesus was dealing with his own suffering. Number one, he said, everything is possible with God or nothing is impossible with God. The second thing, please take away this cup of suffering. In other words, Lord, remove it, shorten it, it's tough. And the third thing is that let God's perfect will be done because everything is possible with, with God. So, how about in today's perspective? So when I was doing research, I, I read an article from a psychologist which gives the, the pattern of, of, of how to deal with, with, with suffering. And, and a lot of times, are, many of us, when we're dealing with suffering, we numb the pain and that's when we go through rebound relationships, alcohol, prescription drugs, and, uh, and, and a whole lot of, of things. And that is typically the first stage but psychologists say you need to go through the second stage, which is typically that you own the pain. And uh, in owning the pain, there's probably going to be tears and anger. And this is where you find the benefit of groups, let's say like Alcoholics Anonymous or a psychiatric counseling session. And these are supposed to help you to own the pain. And once you own the pain, then you can go through step three which is that you grow from it. And in fact, the author of this article says, I find without exception that people that are very deep have gone through a great deal of suffering. And the Bible, as expected, is consistent with science and many, in many ways. And the Bible gives us a pattern, actually, for dealing with, with suffering. And the pattern is this. Step one, we don't suppress our feelings, rather we cast our burdens on God because he cares. And uh, this is how the Bible addresses it. It says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. 
casting all your care upon you, for he cares for you. And God is making it clear that, look, I care for you. Just come and tell me what is on your heart. Come and cast your burdens on me. I know it sounds counterintuitive because you're wondering. God already knows. But the reason why we tell him is because we are humbling ourselves before our merciful judge. The second thing is we count it as part of the process of becoming like Christ who suffered and uh, the Apostle Paul who, as I explained, went through a lot of suffering. He describes it as this. He says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. So we are counting suffering to be part of our participation in Christ because the ultimate goal that God has for our lives is that we become more and more like Christ growing in holiness. And part of that, Christ on earth here went through suffering. So suffering in many ways molds us to become like Christ. And uh, how do we then overcome the pain? Step three is we overcome pain by rejoicing in the Lord. And uh, we probably know the story of Job. When Job was going through suffering, what did he do? He rejoiced. In fact, it says this, I came naked from my mother's womb and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I heard and the Lord has taken away. Praise the name of the Lord. So another verse says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. This means in good times, in bad times, we rejoice in the Lord always. And as I say, if you're suffering, especially because you're a Christian, rejoice, your salvation is at hand. So it's, uh, it's your turn. What will you now do differently now that you understand about suffering? Examples to think about include, where does your hope lie in suffering? Do you place your hope in your merciful judge or do you get angry at him? In what ways are you not like Christ during your suffering? Who was led like a sheep to slaughter and did not open his mouth? If you're not like him, how can you change? I would like to pray for any of you who are suffering. Almighty God, the God who is with us through our good times and our bad times, I pray especially for the person who's watching this video and is going through immense suffering. Lord, you were with Lazarus, you were with Mary and Martha, during the time when their brother had died. And you promise that if we cast our burdens upon you, you care for us and you're with us through the pain. David walked through the valley of the shadow of death and you are with him. I pray for the person who's watching this, that you will comfort them and show them that you're with them and that your purpose will be revealed in due time, whether in this age or the age to come. In your name, Jesus, I have prayed. Amen. Amen.